about tonight holidays and the christian it's it's that time of year this is usually a question that arises during this time of year um what is the place of holidays in the life of a christian can a christian celebrate holidays things of that nature usually uh, come to our mind i think we have to look at it in a couple different ways um, there are those non-religious holidays that, that don't have any religious significance that's placed upon them. Uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, I just jotted these down, Columbus Day, a Memorial Day, Thanksgiving Day, uh, Valentine's Day, Independence Day, um, Mother's and Father's Day, if I didn't say that. Um, those are just kind of those, those holidays that that we have those special days. And then you have some holidays that are associated in some form or fashion with a religious overtone to them. Doesn't mean they should be, but they are. And that would be like Easter or Christmas, of course, Hanukkah, uh, Ramadan for the Jew, for the uh, Muslims. Um, there's Good Friday, there's Ash Wednesday, there's Lent, there's Advent. Uh, what else are there? There's all kind, what? Easter Monday, um, Mardi Gras used to be a Roman Catholic kind of holiday. Now it's more of just a big old party, but it began with religious overtones uh, to it. Um, Lent, if I didn't say Lent, Ash Wednesday. Um, all of those are days that uh, are associated with, um, uh, have been associated with uh, religion. So we want to ask a question tonight about whether those religion, or excuse me, whether those holidays have any place in the work and worship of the church, and then what place do they have in the life of a Christian? So that's kind of where I'm coming from tonight. Let's begin with what I think is the easier of the two, and the first one is holidays in the work and worship of the church. Uh, I think that's uh, a no-brainer for us in the Lord's Church. I think we understand uh, the separation that takes place there, but I think it's a separation that's being chipped away at by a lot of liberal, uh, digressive congregations, and their influence is spreading to smaller congregations. What I mean by that is you have a lot of congregations, I'm talking about in-house stuff, I'm talking about in the brotherhood, you have uh, congregations that are putting up Christmas trees, you have uh, congregations that do Christmas Eve services, uh, that do Christmas plays. Um, you have um, congregations that sing uh, Christmas songs. Um, you have Christmas sermons, things of that nature. Uh, you have, for Easter, you have sunrise services that people have. Uh, decorations also are put up. Um, you have Easter sermons that are given. You have gifts that are exchanged at Easter time. Um, Thanksgiving, not so much. It's really not associated uh, as much, I don't think. But you have, again, you have special worship services that are done on Thursdays uh, where they come together. You have dec Thanksgiving decorations that are put up around buildings. Crafts are done in Bible classes, things of that nature. And the role and faith of the pilgrims is highlighted, uh, things of that. So um, I think we could, would all be in agreement here that how those types of holiday things don't have any place in the work of the worship of the church. Um, once you bring something like that into the work or worship of the church, then you obligate everybody. If you put a Christmas tree in your house, you're not obligating me. But if you put a Christmas tree in the foyer of the church building, you're obligating me. You say you're putting something upon me that's having an impact on my worship. So um, we, have, we always want to be mindful of, of things of that nature. Um, you know, bringing those things or associating those things with works of, of, the, uh, of the church. Um, and like I said, unfortunately, that's growing more and more. 
I think your son is trying to reach you. Um, it's it's growing, and unfortunately, more and more involvement with the church. So we need to be mindful of that. Any questions on that? I think it's the easier one. We're all in agreement. No Christmas tree this year? Because one would go really good. I don't think so. All right. Um, the other one is the Christian involvement in these in these um, holidays. Uh, what part should it play? What part does it play? Is it uh, is the Christian right to have any uh, involvement in religious holidays? How should a Christian view them? Things of of that nature. Um, I'll begin with uh, Romans fourteen. If you want to turn over there. Are these holy days or holidays, are they truly things that Christians should celebrate as being holy days or holidays? Um, in Romans chapter 14, um, this is a passage that a lot of people turn to to justify the Christian celebrating, say, Christmas as a religious holiday. Romans 14, beginning in verse 4. And they'll come over to Romans 14 and they'll say, here's an example where holy days are mentioned and the involvement of individuals in those holy days is acceptable. So they'll try to make a modern day correlation with that to Christmas today or Easter today. Um, I don't think that's what the context is saying at all. But notice what it says, beginning verse 4. It says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands and falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats the Lord, for the Lord give, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat. Or excuse me, he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and give God and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So this is appealed to in the sense of saying, Well, well, look. If you want to have a day that you esteem as being better than another day, then you're okay to do that. If there's somebody who wants to do that and you don't want to do that, then you're wrong for trying to force your opinion or your conscience on that other person where they don't want to do it. Do you see where they're coming from? So to make it easier, if I want to celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 14, verses 4 through 8, gives me that right. Now, is that true or false? Absolutely, it's false. Because that's not what Romans chapter 14, verse I gave you all the way down to verse 9 or, or uh, verse 11 or whichever one I gave you. That's not at all what the context is. The context is the old law, feast of festival. Okay? That's, that's the context. And so what you have is you have Paul dealing with a division that has uh, that is existing in the church in the first century, Jew and Gentile, both coming from different backgrounds. Okay, and so what you have is you have this 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 headbutting in the church, where you have Jews who have become Christians who have brought with them all of their holy days. You have Gentiles who were never under any of these holy days who are coming to the church saying, why should we have to do those days? And so you have them coming together, and you have a problem taking place in the church. And so Paul is writing to deal with that. I think two things need to be kept in mind. Here's the first one. The church is in its infancy. And both Jews and Gentiles are being taught out of their past error. Okay? They're learning that things have to be different in Christianity. And so there's a learning curve. They're, they're, they're having to work on things, okay? They're having to, to grow in certain ways. They're having to stretch their understanding. They're, you know, they're having to mature as Christians. The very fact that we know Paul isn't giving a pass to Jewish holidays being brought into the church is because of what we see in Galatians chapter 4, if you want to turn over there. Galatians chapter 4. 
and beginning in verse 8. Paul says this, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you yearn to turn again to the weak, notice this, and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. The church in Rome needs to be taught out of bringing Jewish holidays into the worship of the church, into the work and worship of the church. Paul in Galatians, as he writes to those churches, makes it clear that those days were for a purpose and for a time, and they weren't to be continued. He calls days, which are Sabbath. There's months, which are the new moon festivals. There's seasons, which uh, Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, Pentecost, years, that would be the annual atonements that were made, sabbatical years, jubilees, things of that nature. And he calls those weak and beggarly elements. Why would he do that? Because they've passed away. They've passed away, right? He's teaching Jews out of the Sabbath. He's teaching Jews out of celebrating the Passover. He's teaching Jews out of reaching the point where they understand that these religious holidays have, have, don't have the same significance in Christianity that they had in Judaism, that they had in the Mosaical dispensation, that things are changing. So when one comes back and says, well, that's the same thing for Easter today, you see. We're celebrating Easter in a religious way, because it's what my conscience, al conscience allows, and I'm honoring it and serving it as a day to God. Therefore, I'm giving it to God, so it's accepted. How do we answer? I know, but then we don't have any discussion, so we got to. <laughs> uh, uh, don't tell me your name. Don't, oh, Bruce. You have to push it all the way up. I did. Okay. Here. Yeah. Well, I don't, you don't find it anywhere in the scriptures that Easter is authorized as a day for us to celebrate. So we sit down and try to celebrate it as a religious holiday, which is in the scriptures. And I mean, what's something we're doing that's not authorized? There you go. Makes me think of uh, Colossians 3 and verse 17. How can we do it thus says the Lord when we don't have any approval uh, for it? Well, let's get back to Easter. Easter is was brought on by the Catholics. I don't remember what year it was, but they're the ones that started it. And what they did, they included some pagan things in it to bring in the, the pagans with it, that, just to build their, their, their religion up. It, it is a holiday that is formatted by the by the Catholics. The Catholic religion we know is is a is a false religion. Yeah. A lot of those have have foundational practices in Catholicism, especially the ones that I had somebody who said to me, um, they they were a member of the church and they said, ah, there's nothing wrong with celebrating religious holidays. There's nothing wrong with Christmas and Easter as religious holidays. And I said, well, I noticed that you don't celebrate Ash Wednesday. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it's a religious holiday, Ash Wednesday. And do you participate in Lent or Palm Sunday? No, I don't do that. I don't mean those religious days. Oh, so even you draw a line between what religious holidays you want to celebrate and what religious holidays you don't want to celebrate. Um, and why do you draw that line? And I, this, is, where's my, this is what they said to me. Because I don't find Ash Wednesday or Good Friday or Lent in the Bible. Then show me. So me. <laughs> show me the celebration of it in the Bible. And I'll never forget that look on his face. Right? We're talking about celebration as a religious holiday. We haven't moved on to secular. Talking about it as a religious holiday. 
Um, I don't think I, I, I don't think we should get off into those areas. We're saying, well, we don't we need to have book, chapter, and verse for all these other things. But when it comes to something just because it's popular, we don't need to have book, chapter, and verse for it. I think we're on dangerous ground. Okay, I think we're on real dangerous ground. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I think Christmas was kind of the same situation. The Catholics brought that in, but they did indefinitely put some pagan things in because the Yule log, that was in Germany, and that was pagans that had the Yule log. So they included that in, in, in Christmas so they could get the pagans to come in. Yeah. It's, again, show me where we have no idea what time of year that, that Christ was born, that Jesus was born. That's no, no, I agree. I you got you got to come up. Sorry. <laughs> the only thing I was going to say is that people have accepted this as a tradition, and they've made the tradition in their mind a truth. Yeah, I think it's a good statement. I think it's a good statement. You know, the Christian, or not the Christian, but Christmas holiday was a pagan holiday, and the Christian adapted that they they seen the all these pagans celebrate and i can't think what god they celebrated but christmas was a pagan holiday and the crit and the i say quote unquote christians decided to take that away from them and make it christ's birthday which is a, fa a total fallacy anyway you know? but it was it was a pagan holiday and, and it may have been the Catholic Church, I don't know, but they brought that in to celebrate that as Christ's birthday in right. direct contradiction to the pagan god that they were worshiping. Yeah. And uh, hand, uh, Chester, hand it to Darren. Yes, I'm back to you. Well, um, if I'm correct, uh, didn't Christmas come in about 300 years after Christ was crucified? So, would that be bringing another gospel? Oh, I like the way, yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. It's it's adding to the Word of God, that's for sure. Um, and again, I think of Colossians 3 and, and verse 17. Um, I jotted down another verse here, um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. And scripture has to be our guide in all matters of faith and religion, or faith, faith and practice. And all scriptures, God breathed, used for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. How can a day that's not even taught in scripture, how can that be brought into scripture as being a day that Christians should celebrate as a holy day? I, I don't see how we can honor. Second Timothy three sixteen, and keep that type of viewpoint. I don't think they're compatible. I think we all agree. We do here anyway that we cannot celebrate Christmas or Easter as as a, a religious holiday. The question you got to come to, I think, is can we celebrate Christmas or Easter in a secular way? I think that's the logical outcome. I don't think I was, you know, a, a, a page and a half of notes for tonight, not not in any of these things that I put down any type of notes to convince you that, that Christmas and Easter aren't religious holidays. I, I figured we were all on the same page, thankfully, exception of Alicia, maybe. But thankfully, we're all on the same page, right? And I think the issue then comes, what about from a secular standpoint? Can we take a day that's, that many in the world say is a holy day, and can we then in turn practice that in a secular way? I think that's where a lot of the conversation um, is had, right? I, I get it. Nobody wants to put a Christmas tree in the building because of the religious significance that it has. But what about those churches that want to put Santa in the building? See, and they're, they're saying... That we're not doing baby Jesus in a manger. We're doing Santa Claus. You know, so you still have that same issue where it begins to creep into the, the thing. I don't want to bring Santa into the... Okay. 
But what you're doing there is you're bringing secular into the religious realm, and that's, that should not be either. I mean, if, if we're going to bring Santa in, why can't we play bingo? I agree. I don't agree we should play bingo, but I agree with what you said. Yeah. Darren, did you? Would be the caller. Well, <laughs> it would be the caller? <clears throat> got to be Jerry. He's got that gravelly voice. Jerry, say B27. <laughs> I, 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 yes, I, I agree with you. I think the issue then becomes what is our involvement? Let, let's expand it just a little. I mean, we'll come back to this, but let's expand it to um, a Halloween. How does the Christian handle um, a secular holiday about Halloween? Um, I know that there are some who put a religious twist on Halloween, the Wiccans, things of that nature. There's the occult, there's paranormal. Uh, people who associate it with things like that, I know that. But then we have to consider the practice of different secular holidays and the Christian's involvement. Mardi Gras. Well, Mardi Gras started out, you know, as a religious holiday. It's, uh, it's, I'm telling you, in Louisiana, it's not celebrated as a religious holiday. It's one big week of partying and getting drunk and all kinds of stuff. So what is the Christian's involvement in something like that, you know? What's the Christian's involvement in something like, like Halloween? So I think those are, it's easy to just look at the religious component, but even when it's secular, what's our involvement as Christians? Where should we be as Christians? How should we handle things of that nature? So I think that's where the bigger for us conversation um, uh, lies for us. Is that, you're either bidding or, okay. Um, so let's let's just do one at a time. Um, so how can the Christian celebrate Christmas and not put a religious significance on it? Can a Christian celebrate Christmas and not put a religious significance on it? The way we do it at our house, we have a Christmas tree, decorates a few things, but we don't we do not put anything in the decorations at all that would be any religious connotation to it. Santa Claus, okay, you know, and we do gifts and so on like that. But the big thing to me about Christmas, and Thanksgiving and all that is the dinner. <laughs> is the dinner, yeah. Um, we, we do Christmas as a secular holiday and we're, we're Christians. And um, thank goodness, since I'm your preacher, yeah, and at least I identify as being Christian. Um, but <laughs> I bet y'all are. <laughs> well, for, that didn't come out the way I meant it to come out. But I, I mean, anyway, we we've always done. We haven't used any of the religious trappings, mangers, the star of Bethlehem on top of our tree. Uh, you know, th things of that nature. We do Santa, Red Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Jingle Bells. We didn't do religious Christmas carols, th things of, of, of that nature. Um, you got to have a, you got to have, you got to have. I don't want to get any more phone calls. I don't know where a lot of these songs get the, name as Christmas carols, because some of them are, are good songs to sing to God, but some of them are sacrilegious, so I think you just need to know, and if they're, if they're good to sing to God, but well, we can sing those anytime, not just, yeah. not, I mean, we can sing them in July, and, and so I don't, I don't see any problem with that, but, but it just seems like some of these songs just come up for Christmas time. I don't know. I really don't know why. Right. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Um, you know, I've been at congregations where I was the odd duck out when the holidays came. And, you know, the song leaders always wanted to have a song service with Christmas songs. The whole service, the whole every single song. And trying to explain over and over again. 
you know, time and time again to people who should know better, you know, but yeah, I think we all see the, how dangerous the blending of re, the religious aspect and the secular aspect can be. And yet we even see the danger of bringing, bringing the secular into the work of the church. Like we're not going to put a big picture of Santa over here. Um, then I think it can go to the extreme. And so then you'll have brethren who will say, well, you have to rule out Santa Claus because he has too many attributes that resemble Jesus. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows if you've been good or bad. So they'll say, you got to... You got to nix old Saint Nick. I didn't even practice that. <laughs> you, got, <laughs> you know, so there's, you just have to understand among the brethren, there's degrees. There's degrees even when it comes to the secular. And then, then you have brethren who don't celebrate it at all. No, not, I'm not talking religious. I'm, or, I'm not talking secular either. They don't celebrate Christmas at all or Easter at all. Is any type of holiday because of its influence that it has in the religious world, and they don't want to add to that. Do they work on that day? No, I'm sure they take that day off. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. But you know, it's yeah, yeah. You know, days off for holidays are okay. If Abe Lincoln could rise from the grave. And stagger his six foot five frame on President's Day and see that his face is being used to sell used cars, I think he would run back into the grave. That's what I mean to you. Uh, come down and get Abe's good deal today on President's Day. We're slacking prices. I think Abe would was turning over in his grave. I mean, there's a lot of days that have lost their significance, but there are still days that does anybody celebrate presidents or presidents? Uh, Memorial Day. The one thing I hear about the most about Memorial Day, other than being driven by the uh, news media, is sales. Memorial Day sales. We're open Memorial Day. Memorial Day weekend. What do people think about Memorial Day weekend? Reverence and all for those who sacrifice for life. Or what do most people do on Memorial Day weekend? Go to the lake and party. So there's a lot of these days that have lost their significance, yet there's still days that people take off. They've lost their significance. Now, I'm not saying that's okay. I think Memorial Day should be a time of remembrance. Uh, you know, certainly Veterans Day, all those days, but, you know, being my... That's what I was going to say. I think there's nothing wrong with honoring deceased veterans. You know, because what that does to you, it gives you, it, it makes you look at history a little bit. That's that's good because if you don't look at history, then you end up repeating what happened to you before. But it is not a religious holiday, and it is yes, it is honoring them who have gave their life for our freedom. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not a religious holiday. Right. So, for those holidays that have a religious connotation. Do we just focus on the secular as Christians? Is that how we deal with that? Uh, let me put it this way. When we have our Christmas dinner, we pray before the dinner, like you do any other time. Yeah. But we do not, in no way do we say anything about it being Jesus Christ's birthday. Right. We have no idea when he was born, except it was over 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. You know, I was thinking about Easter, and Easter is just a mistranslation in the Bible because it's Passover. Passover should be Passover. So Easter isn't even in the Bible. That King James. No, it's no. King James. Okay. Messed up Easter and baptism. Is that King James? I, baptism is just a transliteration. It should, should be immersion. Yeah. yeah. It should be immersion. I, and I've seen uh, 
ones that have it that way. But as far as Easter goes, again, yeah, it was Passover time, but we have no command to have a special. Yes, we do. We have a we have a special day to remember Christ's death. That's every Sunday, Acts 20 and verse 7. Right. Look over at 1 Corinthians 11, and beginning there in verse 23, there is a memorial. There is a day of significance that the Christians, and Leland was talking about this, that the Christian remembers every week. Um, Paul says, for I received, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Well, as Lila noted, that Acts 20, verse 7, that's every week, every first day of the week, we have a day of remembrance something very specific, the death of Jesus Christ. So there you have something that you can look back and see that the first century church celebrated, practiced, that they taught it as part of their doctrine. It was dogma to the first century church, okay? You can't, you can't go back and take modern religious holidays and give them the same weight in Scripture that you do the Lord's Supper. And I think the best comparison is when you take a Christmas or an Easter, and you put it in comparison to the Lord's Supper, you see the, the, the gravity of the situation. I mean, the weight behind the Lord's Supper is so massive. These other ones are just candy. They're just fluff. We actually do not have a command to celebrate Christ rising. Is it important that he rose from the dead? Absolutely, because if he didn't, we would. We celebrate the power and the importance of the resurrection, as Paul said, you know, in First Corinthians, but not a not Easter, not the resurrection, not a special day. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. They don't celebrate a resurrection day. Well, yeah, and you know, I I know some people trying to they would say redeem redeem the day. Those congregations that are having sunrise services and things of that nature. Okay, I, I, I think it's flat out wrong, but even if I, l let me give you the, the, just let me give you the benefit of the doubt that your intentions are good. I'll give you that benefit. Your intentions are good, but your intentions are wasted. Um, you're, you're trying to put religious significance on something and give it the weight like the Lord's Supper does, or has, excuse me, has. And you can't do that. So I think if you use the Lord's Supper as your measuring stick, all these other holidays fall short. What the church practiced, what it believed, what was part of their worship, all these other ones begin to fall short. You begin to see that. So for me, that's my starting point. Here's what the church did celebrate, and it tells why they celebrated it and how they celebrated it. Now, compare that to all the other ones. I was just going to say, you know, these same denominations that put so much weight on Christmas do not put very much weight on the Lord's Supper. Good point. Because, you know, some of them just do it on Easter or Christmas or once a quarter. Good point. Do you, can I ask, do you celebrate Christmas? Yeah. 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 No, I know. I'm not. Just, uh, just asking. Just, just asking. Does everybody here celebrate Christmas? Well, who said not anymore? It's just sad. I'll be your family this Christmas. Go buy me a gift. And I'll, run, I'll open it on Christmas Day. Oh, this is from Chester. What am I going to do with a gold bar? All right. What do we do with days like Halloween as Christians? With all the things that are associated 
with Halloween? How, what would your advice be, or how do you, as a Christian, deal with a holiday like, like Mardi Gras, I think, is easy because all they're doing is getting drunk and drinking. And everything. How, how do you suggest a Christian handle Halloween? Oh, Leland, do you have anything that you'd like to share? Yes. I've always kind of thought Halloween was kind of, not always, after I got old, got to be an adult. And, you know, what are we doing? We're teaching our kids to go out and beg for candy from strangers. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing that was more important, I think, is is the what started Halloween. What was the beginning of Halloween? It was a, it was definitely a pagan thing, and it was it was worshiping ghosts and demons and so on. Uh, I think it's a very questionable thing to to celebrate, if you want to call it celebrate. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. What about what about um, Romans fourteen and verse twenty three? My thing is lagging here. I'll give it to you. Who's got Romans 14, 23? He that doubt what he does not of faith, or whatsoever is not of faith. So if we do something like celebrate Christmas or Easter or Halloween or whatever, and it's not in faith, sin it. If you think wearing red lipstick is wrong, and you wear red lipstick, it's a sin. If you think Halloween is wrong, then don't celebrate Halloween. I think that's the gist of what he's of what he's saying there. First Thessalonians 5, verse 22. Avoid even the appearance of evil. If Halloween, which it does, have have those evil appearances, and and you that is what you are convinced of, then I think for you. To celebrate it would be wrong. Are there other brethren, are there Christians who don't see it that way? Yes. I've been on both sides of the fence. When we were first married, we didn't celebrate Halloween. I didn't want to celebrate. Um, so, we, so we didn't. Um, but we kind of took the approach of trying to get something redeemable out of the holiday and so we took the approach when our kids were, well, you know, just because it's my approach doesn't mean it's the right approach. So I'm, I'm open to discussion where we didn't allow any ghosts and goblins and witches and zombies and things like that. You know, we did Batman and Superman and, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or, you know, because it's better to have a wolf eat you alive than it is. That. Anyway, um, and, and we allowed them to get candy. But we did our best as a family to separate that, what we thought was the unacceptable side of it, as much as we could to filter it out when it, when it depended on us, how we did it at our home, what, what our decorations were. I, my, my thing, our decorations are always internal. And this is a preacher thing. And I'll just share this with you. Our, our decorations for us have always been internal, right, Alicia? Never anything outward, because you have brethren who don't celebrate Christmas. They don't want to see Christmas lights hanging from the preacher's house. So we, as, as a way, all these years, to make sure that we don't offend the brother's conscience, we celebrate our holidays internally in our home. And there have been people who during the holidays we have not invited over to our home during the holidays because I knew how they felt about those holidays and wasn't going to invite them in to something that they disagreed with. So we, you know, we did Halloween that way. In our home, it wasn't witches and all that stuff and, and everything. And, and that's how we chose to, to do it. We tried to get something. Now, we didn't let our kids 
participate in some stuff that the other kids were participating in. And that was hard when the kids were younger. You know, why can't I go over to so-and-so's party and stuff? Well, because of what they're doing, because of how they're dressed. Because, you know, so we tried our best to regulate what our kids' involvement was in it. You know, trying to redeem what we could out of it. But, you know, we, we put some safeguards in. And that's the same way we did Christmas. We put safeguards in. You know, I guarantee you, I, I, 100%, I'm sure, if you ask our children if Jesus was born on December 25th, they're going to laugh. They know that's simply not true. They don't celebrate Jesus' birthday. They don't do mangers and angels on Christmas trees, fingers down a chalkboard, um, star of Bethlehem on top, Leland. You send out Christmas cards. No. We do, but they, that's just us. they will not have anything religious on. Yeah, that's fine. The, I, you were even, just asking me, so I just gave our answer. It's know? not even even the stamps not going to have anything religious. Yeah. Alicia's saying, I've been married to this stick in the mud for all these years. I feel like y'all are leaving me hanging up here. Worshiping the devil. Yeah. And I think Romans 14, 23 is a good thing. If 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 it's something that you're convinced of that ought to, you ought to have no involvement in it, then my advice would be don't have any of that involved time. Don't have any involvement in it. I think you have to be true to your conscience. The only thing that I would say about that is if somebody says, Well, my conscience says that Christmas can be you're telling me to go with my conscience at Halloween. You're telling me not to go with my conscience at Christmas. You can't have it both ways. And and then that's where I'm going to say clearly we're not making a difference. We're not designating a difference between the religious and the secular. You know, the secular comes with all these matters of conscience that you can do. The religious, you're binding something the scripture doesn't bind. You're allowing something the scripture doesn't allow. It's not a matter of your conscience. It's be like somebody saying, well, I think being a Muslim is right because I feel it in my heart. It doesn't matter what you feel in your heart. I think Jesus was born for I feel it in my heart. It doesn't matter. That doesn't make it right. Makes sense. Got a funny feeling. Supper. Father, we thank you for this time of study that we've had. We're thankful that we uh, are able to come together and talk about issues like this, Father, that we will always search the scriptures and make the best decision uh, that your word instructs us to do, Father, how it instructs us to live and the people that we are to be. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take the name of Jesus, we pray.